A warm welcome to today's talk, Friday the 30th of December. A lot of concern about the COVID situation in China. Should we be suspending flights? Should we be uh, testing everyone who comes from China? Should we be uh, reintroducing uh, quarantine? I think the answer to all of those questions is no, and I'll be giving you reasons for that as we go through. And we'll hopefully by the end of this have a fairly good grip of the situation in China as we believe it to be at the moment. Now, first of all, the World Health Organization data here. Uh, now, clearly, we're not allowed to disagree with this, but so we'll just notice that the World Health Organization is saying there's a 160,000 cases a week in China at the moment, uh, with about 300 deaths per week, according to the WHO uh, graphics. Uh, 28,493 new cases in the last 48 hours. Now, of course, infections are going to be way higher. So roughly, where do I think we are in China at the moment? Well, this is based on somewhat back of the envelope calculations, but um, I think it's probably about as good as we've got just now. So we've got 1.4 billion people in China. We'll be infected in the next six weeks. I think that's pretty fair to say. Uh, and it's been going on for a good couple of weeks now. So over an eight week period, suppose infections go over for an eight week period in China. And this is not absurd at all because the R value is probably about 18 or 19 or even 20 in China at the moment. These are realistic figures. Um, that would give us, um, if all these people are going to be infected in an eight week period, that gives us 176 million infections per week or 25 million infections per day. So I actually think that's roughly where we are at the moment in China, about 25 million uh, new infections per day. The prevalence is really high in China at the moment. Now, in terms of deaths, uh, World Meter uh, gives the deaths at roundabout based on official Chinese data just over 5,000, which is clearly uh, nonsense. Interestingly, the World Health Organization gives a, a much higher, a somewhat uh, more realistic figure. But what's the actual figures likely to be for deaths in China at the moment? Well, I think the best estimate just now comes from the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, which we, uh, is expecting 293,000 deaths in China uh, by April the 1st. So that's over the next three months. So that works out at about 100,000 deaths per month. That's about 3,300 per day. So I suspect at the moment, if we use the criteria for COVID deaths that we've used in the West, roughly the same criteria, by our UK criteria or the US criteria, we're getting about 3,300 COVID-related deaths per day in China at the moment, as far as we can tell. But of course, it very much depends on the definitions that we use. That's using similar definitions to what we've used uh, in the West based on this population. That gives us an infection fatality rate of 0.000207. A very low infection fatality rate, actually, when we consider the whole population of China. Now, the other reason I'm not as concerned about the China situation bothering us in the West as uh, others appear to be um, is the variants. Now, the main variant in China at the moment is this BA5217. Now, sometimes called BF7. Uh, it's not an accurate way to describe it. This is actually a variant of BA5. So the variant in China at the moment, as far as we know, is BA5 and its derivatives. And of course, we've had huge amounts of BA5 in the West. We have good levels of natural immunity to BA5 because we've had this huge Omicron waves in Western countries. So cases of BA5 arriving at Heathrow uh, might cause a few more infections, but not that many as we learn to live with the uh, with the infection um, this is a sub lineage of ba5 so it's basically the same omicron um, variant that has caused so many cases in the west albeit one of its many sub uh, one of its many sub variants now this is quite this is quite interesting um italy flight into Milan airport, um, 26th of December. Mandatory testing for people arriving from China in Italy at the moment. Uh, the first flight they tested, 38% on the flight were positive. A second flight, 52% on the flight were positive. 
And and these weren't infected on the flight. The flight wouldn't be long enough for them to come positive. This represents the population in the cities in China. So 38 to 52 percent of the population who got on aeroplanes, of course, is not representative, but it just shows how highly prevalent this is in China at the moment. But of course, they're developing natural immunity very quickly as well. There was no real way around this. Uh, now, the positives in Italy, they are using for genomic testing, so they will know more about the particular variants that are causing the problem in China at the moment. And from what we know, it's likely that these results will show that these are derivatives of the Omicron BA5, which is why I'm much less concerned. If, it, if they turn up with some new variant that we've never heard of before, that would be a different matter, but... I don't think there's any reason to suspect that they will at the moment because even the mutations that are going on in China just now are mutations, as we understand it, of the Omicron BA5 and the sublineages of that. And that is uh, that is less concerning. We're not looking at an alpha or a delta or something like that as far as we know at the moment. Um, Italy Institute for Infectious Diseases, it would be better if uh, there was a coordinated surveillance taking place at the European level. So again, uh, Europe, uh, as in the early stages of the pandemic, has not acted in uh, unison at all. Various member countries doing their own thing. Um, not that we're doing particularly better in the UK, although I think by not testing in the UK, we have made the right decision by not testing travellers from China. So Italy, US, India, Japan, Malaysia, Taiwan, testing passengers from China. Now, quite how this is working out in the States, I'm not quite sure. Do let me know. Um, is the States testing everyone who comes in the country? Maybe they are. If they're positive, are they quarantining them? That would be probably about 50% of the people arriving on most aircraft. Um, not quite sure how that's working out. UK is not testing. We've got 26 full flights due in January, half a million visitors per year. As long as these are derivatives of BA5, uh, that doesn't really concern me um, too much. Um, but there again, we're not testing, so we won't know. <laughs> but uh, we'll get some pretty good indications from the Italian data. So thankfully, the Italians are testing. Um, immune, evasive, more transmissible variants. So lots of people are infected. The more people that are infected, the more mutations we're going to get. But if it's only mutations of BA5, then its capacity for a mutation is limited. Uh, some immune compromise. So yes, there's people that have been infected. Yes, the people that have been vaccinated will become reinfected to some degree. Hopefully they'll be protected against severe illness and death. I would certainly expect that to be the case. Now, what does concern me in China? Ongoing contact with potential animal reservoirs. So uh, eating wild animals in China and selling them in wet markets continues. This has to stop. Uh, this contact with wild species, apart from being unethical, um, is, is a real risk. Not that we're squeaky clean in Western countries because our massive agriculture where we breed up millions of chickens and cows that are very genetically related, again, a bit of a recipe for disaster, really, and giving them antibiotics and things, although that's bacterial, it's an ongoing problem. So... Um, Humankind's relationship with animals really needs to change, I believe. And certainly this China situation with wild animals, that needs to be clamped down on, and it hasn't. Because the virus can go from humans to animals and back from animals to humans. This reverse zoonosis situation, this needs to stop. So the Chinese authorities need to clamp down on these wildlife wet markets, so-called wet markets. That is a risk. That is a risk. But as far as we know at the moment, it hasn't resulted in any uh, new variants that are significantly different from Omicron BA5. Evolutionary geneticist Oxford, I'm not going to predict the direction, but there'll be a whole lot of uh, opportunity for rapid change. Well, certainly they will, because 1.4 people are going to be infected within a very short period of time. Some of those are going to be immunosuppressed, so the virus will be perpetuating in some people for weeks or even potentially a month or two in some people because they can't eradicate it. The partial immune response will give that particular virus plenty of opportunities to mutate. So new variants will arise, but as I say, I'm expecting those to be sub-variants. The real big risk is if a, a new variant comes from animals. Now, having said that, the Omicron variant is still a bit of a mystery where that came from. 
It could have come from an immunocompromised person, but it actually could have also be reverse zoonosis from mice. Either, either way, the world is phenomenally fortunate that we have Omicron now and not Delta and not Alpha and not the original Wuhan strain. China can be grateful for that as they go into their second and potentially final wave that they're going to have all of a sudden. Um, Chinese Centre for Disease Control, more than 130 Omicron sublineages so far. Not surprising, not particularly concerning. There'll be cross immunity quite extensive, very extensively. Um, the fact that 1.4 billion people are suddenly exposed to SARS coronavirus, who obviously creates pro conditions prone to uh, emergence, uh, emerging variants, patently true. I, I, I'm, I'm sniggering a bit because it just seems just incredible. I can't just can't get my head around that 1.4 billion people getting infected basically all at the same time. It's serious. It's just hard to conceptualise. But true. Uh, University of Geneva, any variants were more transmissible than the previous dominant ones, uh, definitely represent threats since uh, they can cause a new wave. True. But at the moment, I don't think there's any indication that that's going to be. So I'm not too worried at the moment. Now, the way the Chinese are defining deaths is a bit uh, interesting. Uh, that was the, um, I forgot to show you that. That's the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation screen there. Uh, the Chinese new definition of death come from here. And uh, I think I'll just let you in on the fact that we didn't use a bit of Google uh, Google Translate here. Um, but I think that's pretty accurate. Um, so this is uh, Professor, uh, Professor Wang, National Health Commission in China. China's revising its guidelines according to this site. Uh, to scientifically and objectively reflect deaths caused by a coronavirus pandemic. Uh, cynics might say to massively reduce the number of people that appear to be dying, which, as we've said, we estimate to be currently three to three and a half thousand per day, based on Western criteria. Um, but in China, they're only saying only fatalities caused by pneumonia and respiratory failure who have also tested for positive are counted. Not a good way to do it. It will give much lower numbers, which, of course, is what they want. Uh, the Chinese are not counting deaths of people who've tested positive for COVID, who have cardiovascular, cerebrovascular disease, causing death, blood clots or sepsis. But what they do say in China, and again, this is from this site, um, this site here. Um, what they say is the main cause of death from infection with Omicron is the underlying disease. That's true. It's absolutely true. So the people that are dying are mostly people with underlying disease. Now I have a report here from China. Um, so, so, so basically, just to summarise what we've said, about three and a half, three to three and a half thousand COVID deaths a day in China at the moment, I would believe, and about um, twenty-five million infections per day. So, twenty-five million new infections per day, and about three thousand deaths per day in China at the moment is what we would expect, but an overall a very low infection fatality rate. Now, this report is from uh, northern China. I know who it's from, but of course I can't tell you. Uh, so my, my writer says, I can confirm there are queues at crematoria in China. But to get this in perspective, one must consider that there are only three crematoria here in a city of five million. So you don't need to actually increase the deaths that much for there to be queues at crematoria. It seems to me that a lot of Western media outlets want to make things look worse in China than they actually are. The bad, 3,000 people are dying uh, from COVID a day by our Western criteria. Uh, only two or three, of course, by the Chinese criteria, but that's nonsense. Um, so it's real, but it's not, it's not massive. And in terms of percentages of people dying for the infection fatality rates, it's way less, way less than it was when we were suffering the Wuhan wave, the Alpha wave and the Delta wave, for example. Um, it's mainly older people dying as they are predominantly, as they predominantly live with their families, they inevitably catch it from family members. So a lot of Chinese live in extended family networks, older people, younger people together. Uh, the writer says, this is a good thing. The good, the good thing is that families are able to be with loved ones till the end and are able to go to the funerals unhindered. We had the 
obscene situation in this country. Obscene situation in this country where people were dying and their relatives were not allowed to be in by their bedside at the time. Utterly obscene, just obscene situation. I've, I've told you before, my dad was in hospital for a couple of months and, and I couldn't go and see him in the pandemic. And yet the chief medical officers and the chief scientific officers and the chief executives that oversaw that obscene programme are still in post. That's fine. No accountability at all for what, what they did to us. That's just a terrible situation. And of course, uh, they're able to go to funerals uninhibited in China, whereas we were restricted for long periods of time. Remember those heartbreaking scenes of, of, of loved ones trying to say goodbye to their relatives who were dying on a mobile phone. It's just disgraceful. That's not happening in China. And the numbers are much less. Also, my China writer says... Um, one also needs to note that only those who actually die of COVID are being recorded as COVID deaths. So, yeah, we know that. As, as we've estimated by our criteria, three to three and a half thousand people a day at the moment are dying. From a population of 1.4 billion, we must never forget. If a person dies of something else, uh, the COVID and COVID helped it along, it's not considered a COVID death as it was in the West. So the Chinese are counting their deaths very, very differently. Uh, to the way we did it in the UK. Now the queues at fever clinics are mostly for paracetamol and ibuprofen. So there's these huge long queues at, um, that we see outside hospitals and things. But that's largely to get basic drugs that people don't seem to store at home in China, like paracetamol and ibuprofen for fever. Now, um, for the vast majority of those people who have fever... I would think it's better not to take ibuprofen and paracetamol to bring the temperature down because the temperature has been put up for a specific reason to help the body combat the virus. Uh, so most of the people there are curing for a drug which actually is probably going to do them more harm than good. But that does explain the very long queues. And uh, people also want to get tested. There's long queues for testing as well. Um most people use lateral flows, which aren't showing positive for quite a few days. And um, I agree, uh, try not to treat China as one small place. It's massive. And there's a lot of variation between regions, including different variants in different regions. But as we've said, mostly BA5. So to summarise, um, China's zero COVID policy was absolutely ludicrous. It went on for far too long. Um, the vaccination rate in China is relatively high. The Chinese vaccines are more effective than uh, a lot of Western outlets would have you uh, believe. They are protecting against severe, severe illness and death. The actual population uh, fully vaccinated in China is actually 91%. Uh, but of course now they're developing uh, natural immunity at a very, at a very high rate uh, indeed. But we're still probably getting 20, 25 million new cases, new infections a day in China at the moment. Is that what I said? I think I said 25 million new cases. Yeah, 25 million, 225,011 uh, uh, cases per day, new cases, about 3,000 deaths. Uh, by Chinese criteria, it was only about one death a day, of course, which is, which is pretty ludicrous. Um, they are going to develop natural immunity very quickly. The peak of the pandemic in China, or their part of their epidemic, part of the pandemic, will probably be in mid to late January. By February, the numbers of infections will be going down quite dramatically. They'll develop fairly quickly comparable levels of immunity to Western countries and the virus will become endemic there, the same as it is here. So um, not really how I would like things, but quite inevitable and, and not really uh, overly concerning, uh, at least in terms of global implications. Um, although it is accelerating quite a few people's deaths, no question about that. So I'm not minimising in any way, um, but I'm not expecting it to bring about great changes in Western countries. That's where we are with China. Uh, thank you for watching.